everybody! My name is Rachel and welcome to my channel, Kalanadi. Today I'm going to talk about everything I read in May. And even though this is a pretty long list of things, um, I don't have a lot to say about what I read in May. Most of these fall very solidly in the meh category. <laughs> even the things that I liked, um, I don't have that much to say about. So let's see how fast I can actually get through this list. Um, so yeah, let's begin with two volumes of Spy Family. This is a humorous manga series by Tatsuya Endo. I read volumes four and five in May, and I did really enjoy these, but I don't have any memories of the individual stories. Um, yeah, like in my reading journal, the only thing that I wrote about volume five, I think, is that I hate Fiona. I really don't like the character. I don't like her storyline. I don't like the one-sided feud that she has with Yor. I mean, who in their right mind would fight over Twilight? <laughs> Anyway, it is a fun series, but I don't have much to say about the events in these two volumes. I also read two more of the Hugo-nominated novellas from this year, um, A Spindle Splintered by Alex E. Harrow and Across the Green Grass Fields by Shauna McGuire. I didn't particularly like either of these. A Spindle Splintered is a, like, a modern fairy tale retelling of Sleeping Beauty, and it did not work for me. There's just this tone to it, this like I don't know, vibe that I just really did not enjoy. I think it was perhaps the the voice of the story, which just was very off-putting to me. But I am also not really a fairy tale person, and fairy tale retelling is not like a selling point for me most of the time. Uh, we're gonna hear that again here in a moment. Um, but yeah, I just didn't really love this, and I'm finding that Alex E. Harrow's stuff just isn't working for me. Back in the day, I read a short story by her, maybe it was a novelette, that I did kind of like, but everything since is just, I don't know, not my wavelength or something. Pretty much the same story with Across the Green Grass Fields. Um, this is one of the later Wayward Children novellas, which has been a series of seriously diminishing returns for me. I really loved the first one, and just not so much later on. Um, this, I think, is the weakest installment of the Wayward Children series that I've read so far. Maybe it's because I don't really love horses. I mean, like, I feel like this story was maybe written about a horse girl for her horse girls. I just never went through that phase. Uh, but th this one is about a young girl who after learning something very shocking about herself, uh, kind of runs away from school and then goes through a portal into her fantasy world, which is inhabited by centaurs. She lives with them and there's a big bad that's after her because she's like the sole human in this world. And so on. Um, I think the theme of this story was supposed to be um, trying to fit into a good gender role and performing girlhood correctly. The main character isn't really good at that, and then she finds out that she is intersex, and this throws her whole identity into question. This all happens very early on in the story, and then it's, like, never revisited. And I'm like, if you're gonna throw that theme into the story, you need to do something with it. So this was very flat for me. I didn't really care for the story or the world it introduced, and I think that it really didn't do justice to this thing that it introduced and just didn't talk about. So, eh. I don't know. I'm not regularly keeping up with this series anymore. I should probably go back someday and reread Every Heart a Doorway and see if it's still as good as I remember it to be because I wonder sometimes. <laughs> Next up is something I did really enjoy. It's one of the highlights of the year for me so far. I read Una Arruga en el Tiempo. This is the Spanish translation of A Wrinkle in Time, the graphic novel adaptation by Hope Larson. Now, it's been kind of like on my bucket list of things to do to read an actual like book in Spanish at some point rather than just like children's picture books. So. I did it. <laughs> I know it's a graphic novel, but still, there's a lot of text in it, and it is for an older age range. Um, so this was really fun. I buddy read this with Shannon from That So Poe, and that was a really great experience. And I am like really familiar with the story. I have read the novel by Madeline Langle multiple times. It's one of my favorites. Um, I've also read the original English version of this graphic novel. So it really helped that I, I remember remembered so much of the story. Um, I understood most of the Spanish, probably because I already remembered a lot of the conversations and I remember the topics of a lot of the scenes, which helped me guess what was going on in the dialogue a lot of the time. And despite that, I still like 
really understood what was going on without the use of a dictionary a lot of the time. So I'm very, very proud actually that I read this. It was very fun and hopefully I will read like one more book in Spanish in the second half of this year, like an actual novel, and I'll be very proud of myself. <laughs> Significantly less interesting than that is A Brief History of Timekeeping by Chad Orzel. As you might expect from the title, this really wants to be a brief history of time, but for clocks, <laughs> it's not. Um, so yeah, this covers a lot of things like water clocks and sand clocks and the creation of mechanical timepieces, etc. It is what it says it is in the title. Unfortunately, I don't understand why this book exists. It is average in every possible way. I wonder what the pitch for this book was. What did Chad Orzel think that he was going to bring that was new to this like topic discussion? Everything in this book, with the exception of Water Clocks, I had already read in other books that were far better and more engaging. Like, you want to know more about the creation of mechanical timekeeping devices that work at sea and how to measure longitude? Read Longitude by Davis Sobel. It's a much better book. <laughs> Way more interesting. Um, so, yeah, I, I know it's a bit harsh to say that I don't know why a book exists, but genuinely, why why? <laughs> One Night in Bucos by A.J. DeMoss. This is the last of her back catalog that I had to read. It's another book set in her um, fictional ancient Mediterranean universe that all of her other books are set in. Um, it is about two men in a foreign city who go looking for their, their master who has gone missing after a night of partying. And uh, throughout the day, as they try to find out what happened to him, they meet other people and have their, their romances and their happily ever afters. It was a good story, I liked the characters, the plot was interesting, but it just wasn't my favorite and I could never shake the feeling that the two main characters were both prototypes for Dami and Verastes from um, Sword Dance. And I, th I think I'm probably right, like down to the fact that, what is his name, Manzana in this one, um, he, is, he is the Dami character, he even has like the same leg injury. The difference is that they're not into each other, they just have separate romances in this book. Anyway, it was fine, I really enjoyed it, I love Demasa's books and highly recommend them. Beyond the Gender Binary by Alec Vide Menon. This is a short introductory book about being non-binary, what that is, what that means, etc. Um, I didn't really need to read this, I guess, because I, I knew what it was about. I know the topic already, um, but it was an enjoyable listen. I listened to it on audiobook and it's narrated by Alec himself. They did a really good job. I, mean, I think they're like a spoken word performance artist or something and it shows. So I did like this and it's part of a wider series of these like introductory books on social justice topics and I think I should seek out some of the other ones on topics that I am less familiar with. Next is Sea of Tranquility by Emily St. John Mandel. I have to say that this is a little bit of a run-of-the-mill literary time travel novel and I really enjoyed it. I just think the execution of it was done quite well. Um, it was a little bit predictable and yet it really drew me in. Uh, this is like the one book from May that I kept wanting to get back to. I was just sort of in this reading funk where I would start something and then put it down and not come back to it for days. But with Sea of Tranquility, I was really immersed in it. I, I wanted to keep reading it. I never wanted to put it down. So that was a really fun experience. I also think that I just really enjoy Mandel's writing style. I remember kind of having the same feeling about Station Eleven. There's just something about her prose and the way that she weaves the story together that pulls me along. I just want like one more chapter or whatever. So this was really good, but I wouldn't say that it's highly original. If you have read time travel stories before, you probably know what's gonna happen this, but it has its own little twists on a few things. Nettle and Bone by T. Kingfisher. I love Ursula Vernon's work, especially the ones under her T. Kingfisher pen name these days, and she is an auto buy author for me. That being said, Nettle and Bone is probably not one of my favorite things I've read by her, and it's hard for me to pinpoint exactly why. Possibly it's because the first half of this novella read very much like a fairy tale retelling to me. In fact, I was convinced that at any point I was going to recognize which fairy tale it was, though I don't think it is actually a retelling. I think it's just got 
the feel and the atmosphere and the original setup premise of a fairy tale. And I don't super enjoy that, as I've already mentioned. <laughs> And then at the halfway point, this definitely goes in a much darker direction and more in the direction of Vernon's fantasy romances, and I love those. So I am, I'm torn on my overall opinion of this. It took me a long time to warm up to it and to really like it for what it was. And then when I did like it, it was because it just bore so many similarities to other works that I liked more by Vernon. So I guess that is what it is. So I did enjoy it. I think I gave this like four out of five stars ultimately, um, but it was probably more for individual parts of it that I thought were really good, like the demonic chicken and the dust wife and stuff like that. And also the fact that it really went into like creepy territory at the end. Not always my favorite thing, but it just, it felt right for the story to do that. So that is Nettle and Bone and my very confusing thoughts on it. <laughs> Favorite Star by Rebecca Roanhorse. This is the follow-up to Black Sun, which is one of my favorite reads of last year. I really don't know how long this fantasy series is going to be. I've been operating under the assumption that it will be a trilogy, but after reading this book, either the story is going to need more than three installments to wrap everything up because it's so slow, or this suffers intensely from middle book syndrome. I'm not sure. The point is that the plot progress in this is almost zero. The story really seems to be more about continuing to move characters into the right places on the chessboard and a couple of interactions when they meet each other, but not so much with the overall like political and religious plot with like an impending war. There's the hint of a lot more action to come, but frustratingly just not a lot happens in this book with the characters aside from them going from one place to another or hanging out with somebody else. Despite that, I really enjoyed this just for the time spent with the characters. I think that's what I really, really like about this series so far, is that all of the characters, all of the point of view characters are just incredibly interesting to me. Like even Naranpa, I didn't really like her in the previous book, but even here, she was super interesting. So I never felt like I was trying to get back to my favorite character. I really enjoyed all of them. Okay, Serapio is probably my favorite, but nevertheless, I just, liked being with them, and Roanhorse is a very good writer. There's something incredibly effortlessly readable about these books, and I, I do love that. So I'm going to pretty heavily criticize this for having very slow plot progress and not much action, but everything else about it is pretty fantastic. Everything else that I have to talk about from this month are comics and manga, so let's do them rapid fire style. I reread volume 10 of The Girl from the Other Side by Nagabe in order to refresh my memory for volume 11, which is the conclusion to the series. I think there's gonna be one more volume of like short stories from this world, and I will read that at some point, but I was disappointed in the ending of this series. I do think that it ends on the right emotional note, like this bit of closure for purely the relationship between Shiva and Teacher. Nothing else is answered. There's like an entire plot arc in the middle of the series that is dropped and never, never mentioned again. And that was really frustrating to me. So I am torn on this. I think that it did some things well, but it was very, very unsatisfactory for some of the more concrete elements in the series that I wanted answers about. Oku the Inner Chambers, Volume 9 by Fumi Yoshinaga. This is a long-running series that I have been reading for the past couple of years now. It is um, like alternate history, um, a gender-flipped version of the Tokugawa Shogunate. And with Volume 9, my interest in the series has been reignited, let's say, mainly because some new characters have been introduced and we've gotten away from the tragic tale of the shogun every week sort of thing and more like characters outside of the inner chambers. I really like that. One of the main characters in volume nine is a half Japanese, half Dutch man who is brought to the inner chambers to teach Western medicine and science to the people there. And I really liked where this particular storyline is going. So I'm gonna continue reading the series. I am almost halfway through. A 
Across a Field of Starlight by Blue Deliquanti. This is a gorgeous young adult science fiction graphic novel. It is very queer. It is packed with diversity and representation. I really loved the artwork beyond everything else in this. It was extremely colorful and bold and there were just there was just so much that you could see in this. Different body types and skin tones and genders and sexualities and everything. It was it was all there. And the story is very much about that, about being able to live in a society where you are comfortable being who you are rather than hiding or trying to fit into a specific kind of mold. So I really I really enjoyed the artwork and the theme of this story. I feel like the plot or like the premise or something of it reminded me a lot of Star Wars and I don't know why. <laughs> That's not a bad thing. I just that's just what kept coming to mind while I was reading it. So this was really good. I really highly recommend it. And I wish that I had access to more things by Delaquanti because I think their their work is going to be really fun to get to in the future. And lastly, I read Heartstopper Volume 5 by Alice Oseman. Yes, I, I watched the Heartstopper adaptation on Netflix, and then I finally got around to reading Volume 4 of this, of this comic series, and I love it. It is extremely cute, and I realized when I read this after watching the show that the show kept like, it was very true to some of the elements of the comic that I think are a little bit kitschy in the show, but are extremely adorable in the comic. And I'm glad that they did that. I'm glad that they kept the intensely cute and happy vibe of this queer romance. It, it was adorable. So there you go. And that is it for everything that I read in May. If you have read any of these and you also have thoughts on them, please leave them in the comments down below. Like I said, a lot of these were very meh to me. They felt very average to me and maybe it was my mood. So if you loved any of these things and you want to tell me why you love them, please do. As always, thank you for being here and I'll be back soon with probably a two-parter for what I read in June because it was a bonkers and very good month. And until then, Bye.